Good evening. As the UC Santa Cruz Alumni Council member, I'd like to welcome you to our monthly series, Slugs and Steins, Lectures from UC Santa Cruz. My name is David Hansen. For those of you who are new, our Slugs and Signs series engages a UC Santa Cruz faculty member in discussion with you, the local community of the Silicon Valley and our extended community online. With the goal of making us all Renaissance people, we want it to feel like you're at UC Santa Cruz sitting in class, but with drinks and without tests. Mike, another volunteer organizer is with me tonight. We're both alumni and spend our days in entrepreneurial companies, Silicon Valley style. He'll be helping me with the Q and A and you'll hear more from him at the end. Before we get started, we'd like to take a poll to get to know our audience and where you're from. Please take a moment to answer a few quick questions that will pop up on your screen. We'll share the results after we've given everyone a moment to respond. Now you should be able to see the results of our poll and who is in the virtual room with you. Today, we raise a virtual stein with D UCSC's D. Hibbert Jones, an Academy Award nominated Emmy Award winning filmmaker. Her work incorporates animation, installation, public art and documentary film, examining power and politics, how people manage and who gets heard. She explores diverse subjects from land use and wasted resources to criminal justice and indigent rights, examining what is considered valuable and who is dismissed as valueless. A Guggenheim Fellow, Hibbert Jones was awarded a United States Congressional Black Caucus Veterans Brain Trust Award in recognition for her outstanding commitment to civil rights and social justice. The Center for Documentary Studies at Duke University's awarded Hibbert Jones the 2015 Filmmaker Award. Now, if you have questions for Dee, please type them in the Zoom's Q&A box below. You don't need to wait until the last minute. Type them in at any time. If you see someone else's question that you like, you can upvote it and we'll ask sooner. We won't be waiting until the end for all the questions. We'll have a couple of breaks. So go ahead and ask your questions sooner. This talk is being recorded. In a few days, you'll be able to find it on the UC Santa Cruz Arts and Lectures YouTube channel. We'll post the link in our social media channels and follow up emails. Okay, does everybody have their stein? Great, I've got your slug, D. Hubert Jones. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really honored to um, be giving this talk and um, my apologies for my very bare back room. We're just moving house. So um, I'm gonna share my screen and uh, show you some images as I talk. As um, David just said, anytime you wanna ask questions, please do. Um, I'm going to start by talking briefly about some reasons why creative practice has a low has about um, creative practice as a social agenda. I thought I'd divide the talk into three sections. First is why and how um, um, art intervenes into political arena. Does it have the power to reflect society and more significantly create change? And then I want to do a segment on my own animated documentaries and finally add on some com comments about the organization that I work with. At any time, feel free to kind of dive in with questions, but I did put some breaks in, in those uh, kind of places. So this is the question that I'm asking. I work with my partner, Nomi Talisman, and this talk grew out of our conversations. We work collaboratively, argumentatively, discursively, creatively, and also um, with conversations with students. I teach art with a focus on art and politics, and I'm also lucky enough to be affiliate faculty in Digital Art New Media, Social Documentary Program, Danum Program, and also the Legal Studies Program at UC Santa Cruz. 
Uh -huh. Before you go further, yeah. uh, do you want to go into presentation mode? Yes, I will. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and so, um, so the question is sort of what are the ways art can intervene in, in the political arena? Um, so how can art embed in our imagination, allow us to listen, hear, understand difference, differences and open up complexities? Can art embed in power formulations and can challenge them? So Leon Golub said, everyone knows artists don't change society, but that's too easy a way to put it. Artists are part of the information process, cannot embed in power formations and challenge them in unexpected ways. Art becomes a part of the context of experience in unexpected ways. So, so then is it possible for art to actually frame reality and for us to re-examine it as a result? Theorist Chantel, um, who's the author of Ag Agnostics, said art makes visible what the dominant consensus tends to obscure and obliterate. And I'm stuck for some reason, oh, there you go. Um, so I'm asking, can artistic practice still play a critical role in a society where the differences between art and advertising have become blurred and where artists and cultural workers have become a necessary part of capitalist production? This is a question that Chantal Mouffe has been asking and just thinking about as our society is changing so much, I don't know about the rest of you, but since I've been teaching at UC Santa Cruz, literally, I'm going back to my other slide, literally how much information students access and in the ways that they do has changed considerably. So thinking about ways that I'm considering how the image itself uh, impacts us right now. So I wanted to look for a second just at the power of gestures in mainstream light, lest we forget the power of images. So here's just, a few ways I've seen images impact the way we're thinking. And impressing and expressing ourselves. And then the context through which these images are revealed many times shifts. Okay, so that like Barack Obama on the same bus. So a powerful and terrifying example, and this is a trigger warning, my apologies for the, some of the imagery in this work, leading, uh, of leading action. One of the first examples would be Birth of a Nation, which originally was called The Klansman, released in February 8th, 1915. This silent drama film describes the relationship of two families in the American Civil War and Reconstruction era over the course of several years. The film was a commercial success that was highly controversial for its portrayal of black men played by white actors in blackface as unintelligent and sexually aggressive towards white women and portrayal of the KKK as a heroic force. It was the first American motion picture to be screened at the White House for President Woodrow Wilson. And the film's release is also credited as being one of the events that inspired the formation of the second era KKK at Stone Mountain, Georgia in the same year. The birth of a nation was used as a recruiting tool for the KKK for all the way up to the 70s. In 2016, documentary The 13th shows how the KKK adapted cross-burning into their practices. Flash forward to the present day, the National Socialist Movement, a leading neo-Nazi group in Detroit, just did away with a swastika in a, quote, attempt to become more integrated in more mainstream. And instead, the group chose a symbol from a pre-Roman alphabet. It was also adopted by the Nazis the Othel, Othel Rune. The symbol was already used by the neo-Nazi youth groups in Germany, for se by several groups in South Africa and neo-fascists in Italy. So what today's activists and organizers and artists are giving us as new ways to see our past and our present, even more, they are giving us the directive to address inequity and equality to now, to make it clear that if we do not do so, we will continue to be drawn back into the bad cycle just as we were after 1965 and after 1992. Right now we have the opportunity to get it right. Our, our shared future depends upon it, according to Jess Chang. This is thinking about the fact that the Watts riots and also that 1992 was apparently the, the, the year prior to now that 
Americans were most concerned about race relations. So sorry, no, it won't let me go forward. So art and regimes of human rights connect through witnessing resistance, cultural survival, education, reconciliation, and restorative justice. So I wanted to talk to you about, um, hold on one second. In 1948, the United Nations Nation Declaration of Human Rights states as natural rights, food, shelter, security, a sense of belonging and self-worth and capacity for self-expression that I survive and I be recognized in my totality. Specifically, articles 27 and 29 talk of the right to engage in social and cultural life as a member of a national community. So the, the right of, of actually of art to exist has been created as part of the UN declaration. Martin Luther King said he when he received the Nobel Peace Prize, I have the audacity to believe that people everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education and culture for their minds and dignity, equality and freedom for their spirits. And so culture is not as a part of human rights, having the opportunity to have your culture perspectives and your body seen and heard. So I believe that art and politics is integral to who we are. So as Audre Lorde so beautifully puts it, it's not difference which immobilizes us, but silence. And there are so many silences to be broken. So these are the reasons that motivate me to make work. Um, <clears throat> and also just to be uh, kind of clearly reminded as, a, as art has a role here to play to make visible reveal multiple perspectives, to disturb the smooth surface of corporate capitalism, the hegemony of white privilege. But I want to acknowledge the reality of lives lived without freedoms and remind ourselves of art's minor role at the same time. As Jeff Chan puts it, while our images depict a nation moving towards desegregation, our indices reveal growing resegregation, inequity and injustice are not abstract things. They impact real people and real lives. So I'm thinking about how much does this moral sentiment approach developed by Hume, that it does not rest on independent moral principles or mysterious moral entities, as Sharon Cruz is saying, or higher powers. It yields one basis right that is fully universal, the right to have one's concerns count with others, to be recognized as a moral equal. This right is generated partly through the exercise of empathy, which enables us to identify in others as well as ourselves, the desire to have our concerns count and the distinctive pain that comes from not counting. And I guess I love this quote so much and it really does kind of encapsulate reasons why for me creative practice counts and why I'm invested in my creative practice. Or as Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, not to speak is to speak and not to act is to act. I'm gonna pause there because that's a fair amount of heavy information to lay on you and see if anybody has any comments or questions or I can keep going if you'd like me to. Anything out there that anyone has to say? We don't. We don't have any questions yet. Uh, okay, I'm going to the audience, uh, All take, right, sounds good. Take, How's take, everybody take, doing out there? It's really always the, the strangest thing about all this is the fact that you're talking into a void. So please do talk to me at some point. So in some ways, what I did was try to frame a little bit for you some of the reasons why I'm thinking about making the work that I do. And my work um, lives among a small but powerful group of animated documentary. Um, makers, um, thinking about why one would make animation out of a topic that it has a real life context to it. So I don't know what any of you saw that I'm, I'm in San Francisco right now and I live in San Francisco and the documentary film festival just had Flea on it, Jonas Poher Rasmussen's uh, documentary, which is actually about a, a queer Afghani um, ma um, man fleeing for his life. Obviously, you have Marjane Serapis Persepolis, which many of you know was one of the very first animated uh, films. Ari Foreman's Walls of the Shia, um, talking about um, Israel and the Israeli war. And Andrew Kiyaji's uh, Wagez Wagezi. I don't know exactly how you say that. My apologies if you've seen that film. I have not seen that film yet, but he also makes um, interactive uh, documentary pieces. Um, so I would want you to say that Nomi and I, my partner Nomi Talisman and I make animated documentaries about criminal justice system, specifically the death penalty. When we began work on Last Day of Freedom, which is a 30 minute short documentary, at the time Nomi was working for a nonprofit organization of mitigation specialists, a community resource initiative. Um, and she was video recording testimony for capital defenses. 
And she would come home and describe the family stories. And we realized we wanted to make a film to bring to life the larger issues of criminal justice and civic responsibility through the stories of families of people accused of a capital crime, perspectives that are rarely heard. So I'm gonna show you a little clip. I'm actually gonna move through this because I think so that you can see what I'm talking about. The cops told me oh, he's not gonna get the death penalty. This is not a death penalty case. They really believed that Manny would not go to death row. We had to go down to uh, talk to a lawyer. I trusted this lawyer because um, uh, he looked like one of those lawyers you see on TV. I mean, he was tall, he was blonde, fancy suit on. I'm thinking he's about something. He had an office right on the on across the street from the county courthouse. I'm thinking this is cool, you know, he's a good lawyer. He told us what the case was. He says, they got special circumstances on your brother. They're going for the death penalty. I go, what? But, 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 the, but the cops, this is a cop. He knew this, this won't be no death penalty case. He'll go to a hospital. Well, the cops did not deliberately lie to me. But when the district attorney got a hold of it, she thought otherwise. Political season. When it's time to pick the cherries, time to pick the oranges, you head for the fields. And you start picking. And you enrich yourself. And that's what they did with the death penalty. When I asked the lawyer, during the courts, I says, I don't see any blacks being seated on the jury. He told me that he did not trust. He used the N-word. I guess he must have figured he could use the nigger word and feel comfortable. So one of the things that um, the story of Bill Babbitt, which is a 30-minute animated short of, uh, of Bill's story of turning his brother into the police, he realized his brother, who's a Vietnam veteran, had um, committed a crime um, coming back from war. Um, he had a PTSD ep episode, broke into an old woman's house and, and she'd and beat her up and she died. Um, so be fearing for his own family and the safety of Manny, he went to the police. Um, when he turned him into the police, believing Manny would get the help he needs, trusting his, placing his trust in the police, um, he basically, um, his brother was <clears throat> accused of a capital crime and executed on his 50th birthday. Um, he trusted a racist drunk lawyer with Manny's defense. He trusted that um, Manny would, when he was awarded a purple heart on death row, that would stop his execution and did not. Um, so thinking about how do we think about um, telling a story like this, we began to decide how could we tell Bill's story, which is so incredibly painful in a way that would allow audiences to access it and that we would really be able to feel his pain and not be consumed by it because it's an extremely um, traumatic story. And so we thought about Jenny Edkins' quote, who we are, who we think we might become, depends very closely on the social context in which we're placed and we find ourselves. Our existence relies not only on our personal survival as individual beings, but also in a very profound sense on the continuance of the social order that gives our existence meaning and dignity. If that order betrays us in some way, we survive in the sense of continuing to live as physical beings, but the meaning of our existence has changed. Any illusion of safety or security is broken. And so for Bill, what he believed was he would trusted the police, he trusted the system and the system betrayed him. Um, and if you're interested in the full version of Last Day of Freedom, I did put it into the chat for you. So you're welcome to watch it. Right now it's available on Canopy, but otherwise, you can't see it. Um, I'll send. I'll show you just another little clip. Oh God! What will my neighbors think? Will they think that I'm a bad person? That we're bad people? Uh, what will my mother think? Would she understand that? I had to do what I did. 
What would Manny think? Okay, so. Ah. Um, I don't want to quote, quote right now. I'm going to go back to this one. I just want to talk to you for a second about why we chose to do animation for these. We really thought about the emotional impact and the ways in which symbolic imagery could be used. Um, the fact that Bill is forever going to San Quentin, he's continually moving on the road um, to, to execute his brother. And so we decided the best way to do that would be to actually take that trip to drive on the road to San Quentin ourselves, film it. It was the old Bay Bridge. Um, we filmed as him going over and we thought about the fact that he also says once his brother was executed, we're all, we're all implicated now. We all have blood on our hands. So we started putting that onto the billboards and thinking about how could we push the metaphors so that while you're also con sort of consumed in Bill's story and hearing him talk, you're also thinking about the symbolic meaning of what execution means in the minds of the public. We're thinking about what that means to, to Bill himself. And we're thinking about those larger implications. This is why we thought about blood on our hands and why I actually drew these images. Um, Nomi and I do all the drawings for Last Day of Freedom and then we collaborate and work with students who actually help us do in-betweens and then we talk to and build those images with them. And so thinking about these images of moving continually, he will all, Bill will always be moving um, on the road to San Quentin. Similarly, thinking about the way and why we animated um, his um, expressions so closely. We started by the very first thing that we um, started working on with the interviews. We did multiple interviews with the families was, um, was a, a family that was um, needed some anonymity. So we just began playing around with animation, but we realized that there was a way that the intimacy that you could get with these images made a difference to allowing people to really hear the stories. We wanted it to be that um, individuals who never would consider hearing these stories would bring these stories um, um, and allow them to hear what Bill was saying. Animation allows a distance from the subject. It's also an intimacy with the subject and the subject matter. So there's this very odd possibility of being slipping between the barriers and setting up this resistance to intimacy and at the same time, allowing you the ability to see it as outside of an individual. The intimacy of depiction, drawing Bill and details up close, uh, intimacy increases as the story unfolds. He gets closer and closer to you, draws the viewer into a relationship with Bill and his family. Witnessing his face as we only see the face of a lover or a child up close in, in, in intensity, intimate spaces. The only part of Bill's story that we chose not to depict and we did not translate into images and metaphors was the execution itself. And partly that was thinking about the spectacle of execution and that we didn't want to, to um, depict and create that. And similarly with, the, with the, the death of an individual who also was important. Lauren Berland describes compassion as a social relation between spectators and sufferers. Then she extends this definition and she suggests that the bond, uh, the, uh, Levinas obviously talked about it, the individual and collective obligation to read a scene of distress, not as a judgment against the distressed, but as a claim on the spectator to become an ameliorative actor. And we really wanted to kind of create that intimacy. So what about that? What's the relationship between compassion and becoming dis and, and distancy from responsibility? Compass compassion for Bill is one thing. What about translating that into action? So. As Levinas says, the bond with others only made as responsibility. Bill's testimony implicates us all in the failures of a criminal justice system, the lack of support systems provided for veterans, just before Veterans Day, support for black men, and questions of how and what bring, brings us to act. It feels ludicrous in many ways to be having conversations when we're actually killing people. We have been lured into a false sense of security. We live under a system where justice does not prevail. And so, so um, thinking about people who are actually um, on death row currently. And the court is yet another public arena where people tell their stories, hoping that it becomes a convincing narrative or a truth. Bill was not able to deliver his story actually in court. He was never allowed to fully tell his story. So I wanna go back to the image for a second, <clears throat> um, which left him in a state of trauma. 
His untold story haunted him for decades. And as our main collaborator and participant in the film, the act of telling was a healing act for Bill. His testimony was finally delivered in Last Day of Freedom. And Bill is our audience zero, to borrow the medical term for patient zero, and number one collaborator. There's no one that the film affected more than Bill. Our responsibility to him and his story brings us to mind the bond with others only made um, as responsibility. When we started working on this project, we connected to several organizations that were interested in working to bring the film to their own audiences, <clears throat> some with broad reach. Death Penalty Focus, for example, uses the film not just in direct action political context, but also for educational program and for high school screenings. We see tremendous value and meaning in these collaborations. One um, unexpected uh, craziness of, of going to the Oscars was the fact that um, we ended up uh, with the film being uh, um, uh, used by the Israeli military and the police force for um, PTSD trainings. We would like to have special interest groups bring the film to their audiences. And as the film reached mainstream distribution, the audience grew, as well as awareness and responsibilities, race, criminal justice, mistreatment of vet veterans. The film's reception exceeded our expectations. And so <clears throat> if there's anything that mainstream uh, attention brings along, it's attention in numbers, and it was a, a screened in approximately 200 theaters across the country, uh, 35 set festivals internationally, it's streamed on Netflix, and all of the, a whole series of major um, audiences um, came to the film, which was quite incredible. This is just a little bit of how the film is made, so you can see how we're working on it. Um, and then I'll stop and I'll see if you have any questions from there. And uh, they asked me if I could get them to, to confess. When we met Bill, uh, I don't think I'm going to, I don't need to show you the other bit. I just wanted to show you a little bit of the beginning of that so you can see some of the ways that um, we move forward. We heard his, oops, I don't want to show that. I want to go forward. There we go. That won't let me. Okay. Does anyone have any questions and comments now? That might be a good place for me to stop for a minute um, as we go. Yep. Any questions we got? Why don't I just keep going? So I, I, I guess I have a question. Mm. Uh, you talked about using animation as a way of balancing emotion, uh, the emotional impact while still giving enough distance for people, that's my interpretation, mm -hmm. so that they can, uh, they can absorb it. Where do you see animation being best as opposed to uh, pure regular film documentaries. Where, mm. what, what, what are the differences in effectiveness of those two? Well, maybe a, an example would be, thank you for that question. Maybe an example of a, a way that uh, we discovered animation could be powerful. Um, uh, when uh, the very end of the of Last Day of Freedom, uh, the, uh, the uh, bill is, breaks down in tears and begins to cry. And I hadn't finished animating that piece. And I showed it to a group of faculty and students at UC Santa Cruz. And I realized that once the animation shifted, people's attention was fully focused on the animation. Once the animation shifted um, and, and it was back to a, a kind of real life, um, it, I noticed that the audience was unable to actually witness and sit without shifting or moving away. And so thinking about the fact that somehow allowing this line to be a depiction allows um, us to have a sense of distance and, and see that image as not us. On the other hand, it also allows us to completely connect or empathize. There's supposed to be this notion of spaces between images that allows us to see or enter into kind of a possibility. And we discovered that multiple times that, um, and also obviously you have the sort of sense of metaphor. Michael, did you have a question too? Yeah, let me ask, uh, I'm, I'm curious how, how you met Bill, how you were first exposed to the story. Mm -hmm. um, well, basically um, my partner Nomi was uh, working for a nonprofit organization 
um, and doing uh, work from them on uh, death penalty advocacy cases outside of grad school, of art school. It was their first job, uh, her first job. And we came across a series of stories and uh, she kept coming home and telling stories of the impact on whole communities um, of the death penalty. And um, we just said, well, we've been working on um, creative practices for some time, talking about little people and big systems. And this seems like such a perfect way to try to really um, bring to life those stories. So we went back to the organization and said, shall we make just a very short piece, which maybe you could use, maybe we'll make into an art piece and maybe you could use for your, um, for your nonprofit. And this is Community Resource Initiative. And, um, and that became a very, very large extended project that took us multiple years to finish um, and, and became Last Day of Freedom. And they recommended that we talk to Bill. At the time I had said, I'm not sure whether Bill's such a great person to choose because um, it's such a complicated story. It has veterans, et cetera. And then I talked to Bill on the phone and realized that he was a perfect person to tell this story. And the reason why it felt really vital to be telling his story. Um, so perhaps, so, I'll, sorry, do you have other questions for me? Go ahead. Yeah, I had one, one for the question. Uh, hmm. It has to do with the resources required. 30,000 uh, images now though done with uh, with modern technology, what, what kind of uh, hours of work, if you will, per minute of animated film do you count on to do it well? Well, um, we do, we, we create in a completely irrational way, which is uh, not the most uh, logical in terms of, um, of a, a kind of production process. Um, but we believe that what we want to do is we hand draw each of the drawings, we draw them on a Wacom tablet. And um, so we draw every other frame of, uh, of shot imagery that's uh, for the lip sync. And that was because we didn't want to have um, the subject of our films. Um, <clears throat> we don't want the subjects of our films to their lips. Sometimes when you see other kinds of animation, which are um, more technology based, um, the animation of the mouth or the matching of the audio and the visual is not completely aligned. So the only way to make that absolutely perfect and to be able to have each line and gesture is to have this um, rotoscoped kind of like drawing sy system. So we draw, um, it takes us a very long time. And that's why um, it takes us hours and hours to finish. But the, the concept was to try to make it as um, legible as possible, as real as possible, the texture and the material of it as um, kind of convincing as possible. Does that make sense? Yep. So we have one more question from Stuart. Uh, I'm trying to understand, Stuart says, uh, the timeline, the flow of the context. Did you interview Manny while in prison? Did you have good access or much restricted access to him while in prison? That's a great question. So um, just to be clear, um, the interview is only with Bill Babbitt, which is, um, Bill's, um, is Manny's brother. And so Manny Babbitt, um, unfortunately, had already been executed when we began the interviews. And part of the kind of power of Bill's storytelling is the fact that he has been telling the story. He was, he was um, <clears throat> trained to tell the story on the stand, the witness stand, and he was never able to actually tell his story fully. He was interrupted. He was actually called for a, um, in the prosecution and defense as a witness. And so um, we're telling the story from Bill's point of view. So it's Bill telling about his brother, Manny. Um, so basically what we did was we sat down with Bill, the way we work our films is we interview. Um, because it's a very sensitive issue, we often work with um, Community Resource Initiative to make sure we don't re-traumatize. But what we do is we work with me interviewing and my partner Nomi filming with two cameras. We get the interview, we come back, we edit the entire thing into what's called a radio cut. And then we animate that. And so thinking about where do we need to see Bill's face? Where do we need to see other imagery? Where do we need to see archival footage or information, histories? And then we animate all of those pieces and connect them together and make that into the seamless film. Does that answer that question? I hope, uh, Stuart, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, one, I think we'll take this our last question. We have uh, from Kimberly. You said it was vital that Bill's story be told. And I'm just wondering, how did you decide that? Was it because it is more compelling because it, it was a, a vet with a purple heart? Was that the main thing 
uh, you were looking for a sympathetic that's angle or was there something else? And that's also- a great question. And, uh, and, um, and I have to say that for me, actually, when I heard it was a veteran and a purple heart issue, that for me felt super complicated just in terms of the amount of story we would have to tell. So I was actually kind of hesitant about telling the story in that way. The reason um, that uh, I wanted, we wanted to tell a story of the impacts on a whole community. And so we were looking for stories and we actually approached Community Resource Initiative and said, do you know anybody who would be a great storyteller for this? And they kept saying, talk to Bill, talk to Bill. We interviewed several other people. We realized that because um, Bill had been telling the story for years and had been thinking about the story, he had been mulling and kind of perfected the telling of the story, but also Bill, and I hope that you believe that or see it when you, when you see, if you see the film, um, is an extraordinary storyteller. He is very um, charismatic and he tells the story in a very emotional way. He's also very direct. And he was able to tell it to us and as if it was really happening, even though it had been years. So for us, the power of that story and why it felt like it was the story that we had to tell was that it had the possibility of allowing an audience to put themselves into Bill's shoes, to think, what if it was my brother who I realized had committed a crime? And um, what would I do if I then called the police and they and they took him in and they thought everything was going to be OK? You know, how would I respond if then my entire family stops talking to me because he then is executed on his 50th birthday? So for us, it felt like it had so many elements to it. And then the fact and this is partly another thing for me, I come from a country that doesn't have death penalty I'm from England, but Really, I was also looking at the places where um, Manny and Bill have been failed by so many systems of support. So there's mental health. Um, Basically, um, Manny was hit by a car when he was a kid, and so he was uh, unable to to actually pass the test to get into the military. And apparently there's a um, military uh, kind of term that was defined off, which was called McNamara's morons, because they lowered the IQ test for people, he actually failed the test, but they um, gave him the answers so he'd get in anyway. He did uh, two tours of duty, came back and um, was homeless, and then was on the streets on the East Coast before um, Bill brought him home to Sacramento. And this all happened in Sacramento. Um, So this story just had so many elements to it, yes, but also Bill is just an extraordinary storyteller. So it felt like it was a great story that could be told, great in a terrible, awful way, to be told to kind of like open up so many questions of issues of mental health support um military kind of commitment to that someone could go into the military and then be executed kind of a suffering afterwards it just felt like it had so many elements to it does that make any sense yep great um shall i keep going yeah let's uh pause questions for now and keep going okay sounds great so so i wanted to just talk a little bit about we were um Lucky enough, as I said, you know, to have the film um, um, go to so many places. Um, So now we are actually working on a second project, um, but I really wanted to think about for a second some of the questions that we've been asking ourselves in relation to this. How can we make this work meaningful? What does it mean for us? And who is the community we're trying to talk to? Who's the audience? Where will the work be seen? Okay, who can benefit from it? And who am I to tell this story? And should I be doing something else? Like, um, you know, why do I care? How can I be involved? And then trying to remember that we're all insiders and outsiders. We all belong to many groups. Um, So we discovered that through practice, experimentation, intelligence, and and attention and diligence that these ideas evolved and collaboration between the two of us. And so um, uh, I, I don't, know whether I, I don't know whether I want to talk about this. Perhaps we should just keep going. This is actually about the very first spectacle of executions the, like, and the fact that Henry Field said a murder behind the scenes. If the poet knows how to manage it will affect the audience with greater terror than if it's acted before our eyes. And so part of the intention for us was really trying to bring this subject back into the public eye. It's not the essence, essence of the thing itself, but the dress and apparatus of it, which makes an impression on the mind. And then thinking about what we thought about in relation to to, uh, how we could create an an art form and a creative practice that somehow allowed um, 
the feeling of um, empathy or connection or shame as uh, as Eve Shed Cedric puts it, she says it's the bad treatment of someone else, bad treatment of some, by someone, someone else's embarrassment, stigma, debility, bad smell or strange behavior, seemingly having nothing to do with me, which readily can flood me with that sensation of shame. And I think that's another reason for us in terms of um, Last Day of Freedom and the choice of Bill was, there's so many ways in which one, once one is accused of a capital crime that one becomes and the family becomes reviled and thinking about how to bring that back to a sense of intimacy or connection. In order for something to be called traumatic, an event must be more than just a situation of powerlessness. It's an important sense, it has to entail something else, have to involve a betrayal of trust. And this is where we felt like Bill's story really talked about the failures of the trust in the system that should have supported Manny at so many times and trust that Bill had turning his brother into the police and into the judicial system and that that fell apart. How can we open those things up so it becomes a, a situation of empathy and connection so that people start to ask those questions about the larger systems we live within? Um, last one from, from Bill. No, I can show you. The cops told me. Oh, I'm sorry, I think that one I already showed He's you. So I'm going to move on from the, the death. I think I got no, it. This is not a death penalty. Did I show you this one already? Can somebody let me know? I, I wanted to make sure. No. Case. They really believed that Manny would not go to death row. We had to go down to uh, talk to a lawyer. I trusted this lawyer because. Um, he looked like one of those lawyers you see on TV. I mean, he was tall, he was blonde, fancy suit on. I'm thinking he's about something. He had an office right on the right across the street from the county courthouse. I'm thinking this is cool, you know, he's a good lawyer. He told us what the case was. He says, they got special circumstances on your brother. They're going for the death penalty. I go, what? But, 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 the, but the cops, this is a cop. He knew this, this won't be no death penalty case. He'll go to a hospital. Well, the cops did not deliberately lie to me. But when the district attorney got a hold of it, she thought otherwise. Political season. When it's time to pick the cherries, time to pick the oranges, you head for the fields. And you start picking. And you enrich yourself. And that's what they did with the death penalty. When I asked the lawyer during the courts, I says, I don't see any blacks being seated on the jury. He told me that he did not trust. He used the N word. I guess he must have figured he could use the nigger word and feel comfortable. So my apologies for showing you the same clip twice. I guess I messed up and put that in twice, which I didn't mean to do. Ah, now I can't get rid of it. Okay, okay. So my last um, kind of quote from Lauren Berlant, the individual and collective obligation to read a scene of distress, not as to judgment against the distressed, but as a claim on the spectator to become an emulative actor. So this is what we're hoping to do is to bring people forward <clears throat> and allow them to come forward into it. So I'm sorry, I think I had rep repetition of my images. It's like so strange. Anyway, here I am back to our new documentary film. Um, so we're working um, uh, right now to do our first um, animated documentary feature. Um, so an even longer process than before. We've started working, um, we've been working actually with this family. Um, I don't know if any of you know Troy Davis's case. Um, it was um, entirely animated. It's going to um, to describe the impact on um, his whole family, but from the perspective of his nephew, Dejan. Um, so uh, basically um, the film, just to, to let you know, it's very personal to us. We're raising a black boy. We've been interviewing families of prisons on death row since we first adopted our son, um, who's now 12. And so um, the investment in the lives of young boys of color is something central. So we decided that we would look at uh, Troy Davis's case, which is a major amnesty case, 
from the perspective of his um, nephew, Dejan, who grew up visiting his uncle on death row. Um, he first met his uncle when he was two months old. Um, at 21, Troy Davis was accused of killing a white police officer in Savannah, Georgia. He was convicted on eyewitness testimony alone. There was no gun or DNA, no hard evidence. Dejan's mother, Martina, fought for 20 years to prove her brother Troy's innocence. Over the, seven of the, over the years, seven of the nine eyewitnesses recanted their testimonies, but they were never allowed to tell their story in court. Um, this law is still in place today. Um, despite an international campaign of too much doubt, Troy was executed in 2011, and Martina died of cancer shortly after. And our subject, Dejan, was still in high school, and he was 17 years old when he was the person who actually led the protests against his uncle's execution. Um, and um, so the film is entirely animated, and um, we anticipate the whole thing will be about 100,000 individual drawings. And so we're trying to immerse um, the viewer in this context, complex world of feelings and real experiences, and then also provide some safe distance from the traumatic experiences, as well as an intimacy and connection with storytellers. And we hope that it creates the storytelling in a vivid, immediate ways and integrates multiple perspectives and time periods. This is a fairly complex story. Um, and so it's a story of loss of a community denied their right to be heard and a man caught in a series of legal obstructions that denied him his life. Um, and just perhaps to talk about where we're thinking about this film, where it would go. And so uh, the sort of agenda we have behind the work, and we're hoping to bring it to policymakers in DC to talk about death by zip code. Currently 2% of counties in the United States account for 50% of all executions. And our primary target audience of the films are minority youth currently underprotected and overpoliced. So we're thinking about bringing run rivet communities to fix the relationship between the community and the police. Ambitious, very high arms to bring our film to activists working with impacted communities. And then we're working with a small network of organizations on criminal justice reform and trying to think about bringing those. Uh, things like Equal Justice USA, um, Community Resource Initiative, um, what we discovered with Last Day of Freedom was that we could, the film was actually used for training and discussion forums, which was amazing, and also um, uh, for uh, race and reconciliation and nonviolence work. So, um, so we're hoping that we can, we can continue that and that a feature length film will get more attention and have more time to kind of like really tell a story. And so, so, and the other thing was just to really think about who sits, who really sits at the same table, you know, vulnerable populations and then um, law and policymakers, and can we bridge the back gap between some of those areas? Um, so in thinking about bringing this, the film to schools and colleges, of course, and to discuss um, and encourage engagement with youth around politics and participating in alarmingly low outcomes to local elections, which actually is one of the reasons why Troy was executed. I don't know if anybody has actually heard his case. Um, 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 I wanted to um, switch, and I have to stop sharing and switch the screens to do this. Um, in order to show you the work, I have to show you, um, I have to show you a, a piece from the work in progress, if you're interested. So let me reshare that screen. And show you some of this film in progress. This is a uh, run with it. Okay, hold on, my image is not. <laughs> I respect my mother, whether she's here or not. One of the things she told me before she passed away, she was like, I know I won't be here. I don't want you to continue the whole Troy Davis stuff. She said, I want you to focus on school. My life's goal was to do Troy stuff. That's not your life goal. She said, this battle stops here with me. I don't want to hear anything else about it. Probably the only thing um, that I wish she probably would have told me 
uh, earlier they have been yeah where Troy was instead of telling me he was in college um, just actually telling me you know he's in jail yeah you know, I was just like well I wish I would know he was in jail a long time ago obviously she told a fib in a kid's term uh, but it was a justifiable fib psychologically He's in college, 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 college. Instead of jail, jail, jail. Every time you mention your uncle, you just say, you know, college instead of jail. It's to give you that positive perception rather than a negative uh, one. When I first realized we were in a prison was, I think I was maybe 10. My mom used to always tell me he was in a university, like Georgia University or something like that in Atlanta. I was like, you know, I'm like, well, what kind of college has bars? But I never really, you know, put two and two together. And then that's when I finally asked, I was like, mom, where is Troy? Seriously, like, where? And then she caught herself and she was like, okay, it's time to have a talk. She told me, you know, he was in prison. Um, and she never told me why. What she did was she had all the files and stuff that she had on the case and information she had and just put it in front of me. She was like, read. I was like, read what? Like, I can't pronounce some of these words. She said, read, like just read it, read as best you can and then ask me questions. Because of the following special broadcast, tonight's CBS Late Movie will begin 30 minutes later. That night, I turned on the television. This was uh, an execution-style uh, murder. 20-year-old Troy Anthony Davis, the man police say is responsible for murdering and Savannah police. Wanted, dead or alive, cop killer Troy Anthony Davis on the news, and there's a picture of my brother in a New York Yankees jacket that my husband had given to him. Right. And I was like, Savannah. what the hell is that? Fellow officers frantically trying to save the life of Mark McPhail, shot at least twice, once under his arm with a bullet severing his aorta, and once in the face. The three-year veteran of the force was working a regular Friday night shift as an off-duty security guard at the Burger King Greyhound Complex. He approached the parking lot after learning of a serious assault. A man had been pistol whipped by another part of a group of three. I, I was sitting there like, did they, did they say Troy Davis? Wait a minute, this is just crazy. This individual pulled a, what we believe to be a 38 caliber uh, firearms out of, his, uh, out of his belt or his waist. The officer attempted to get up, and uh, the assailant uh, at point blank range shot the officer in the face. Yeah, it must be some kind of mistake. So I'm trying to frantically call my mom, call my mom, call my mom. She was away at Bible study or church or something. I finally get over to my mom's house and they're like different neighbors and stuff over and they're talking to my mom, you know, you need to get your son a lawyer. And I was like, what's going on? And she said, the police came over here and they had SWAT and everybody all over the rooftop saying Troy killed a police officer. I said, what are they talking about? There's no way. I mean, Troy wouldn't have done anything like that. My mom was petrified. The police had come to her house. They had the whole street blocked off. They were on the rooftops. They were everywhere. They threatened her and saying, you don't give us your key. We're going to go in there and we're going to kill your son. All I could think of was, we've got to tell Troy what's going on. All right, let me stop it there and go back to my PowerPoint. So that gives you a sneak preview of what we're doing right now that uh, actually hasn't, um, and it hasn't been um, shown to anybody else at this point. Um, and I wanted to maybe sort of like highlight them um, again, sort of some of the kind of uh, issues behind it and why we're thinking of animation. Um, Brian Stevenson says the opposite of poverty is not wealth, the opposite of poverty is justice. I've come to believe the true measure of our commitment to justice, the character of our society, our commitment to the rule of law, fairness and equality cannot be measured by how we treat the rich, 
the powerful, the privileged and the respected among us. The true measure of our character is how we treat the poor, the disfavored, the disused, the incarcerated and the condemned. And so part of our investment in working, um, oops, and again, I'm not sharing properly, sorry, um, in, in, in focusing on these families was really to kind of look at people who are not considered to be the most valued in our communities, uh, the people who are um, reviled for something that's happened to their family members and to think about that community and thinking about that practice of, of looking at and creating and trying to create animation and use animation to tell those stories to bring audiences to an understanding in ways that perhaps stories that they would not otherwise engage in. So um, basically one of the things we wanted uh, with this story was to, to make sure that um, we began it with the success of uh, our, our subject. So um, basically Dejan is just recent a graduate from Morehouse and is uh, succeeding um, in his own life. At the same time, he carries the trauma of his family and the experiences um, that uh, that his uncle went through and the understanding and challenges of living as a black man in a culture that um, potentially sees him judged before. Um, the feeling of it. Um, so one of the things I was asked to, to do was to, to talk with you about um, an organization that I believe is really um, uh, exciting and would be a great person, uh, uh, thing to contribute to if you are interested. And so this is Community Resource Initiative, um, the nonprofit that we collaborate with. Um, principally, they do two things. One of which is that they are mitigation specialists who work um, legal cases to, um, to work and investigate the kind of complexities of what has happened to people who are um, incarcerated on death row. And then the other thing they do is to work with the communities to try to um, support and bolster those communities impacted by racial and economic justice, injustice. Um, so one of the programs that I find most powerful they do is a program called Reading Between the Lines, where they actually um, pay for children to read books, uh, for, for parents, incarcerated parents to read books to their children. And they pay for that service and for the telephone calls and for the books so that the kids get to know their families who are on death row. Um, and just a, a, a sort of like a small um, drawing of um, Dejan when he was a very tiny baby to think about the impacts on the communities that we're dealing with. And I think I want to stop there and see if there are any questions, um, any comments. Um, I could definitely go back. Um, shall I stop sharing and maybe pull to my, my image of myself? Would you, shall I do that? Any questions or shall I keep going? Yeah, you can stop sharing unless you want to refer back to something. I might refer back to something or bring something else in. Let me... Okay. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll, start, uh, uh, we'll start with a question from Charles. Uh, what are other media that are effective to make compelling data, I guess, besides animation? I was thinking <laughs> about print, still images, a la uh, Tuft. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess now I'm going to go back to my share, right? That's a great question. And uh, now I have to go back to, to look at my... Um, my my um, images again, just one second. Let me pull them up. Um, yeah, there's many other ways to obviously to, um, I'm gonna go back to first images. So Leon Gold, for example, is doing painting work. Uh, this is a, one of my favorite Hank Willits Thomas uh, images. I don't know if you know that, it's a photographic image of um, literally they're manipulated photographs. So thinking about corporate images and messaging and, uh, culture. Uh, this is an image by Jenny Holzer, um, who is um, putting challenging messages onto um, media screens everywhere, uh, having us think about these truisms, um, pop culture, and questions about uh, different thoughts about kind of politics. Um, uh, are the ones that I would say really powerful images that um, uh, I think speak really loudly. Um, there you go. I love this image by Dred Scott. Um, 
uh, just thinking about the impossibility of freedom in a country founded on slavery and genocide, just literally as a fire hose that he is fighting against performative pieces. I think artists are working in multiple ways, poetry, um, the films I talked about in terms of the other animated films, um, so many ways that artists, I think, are, um, are kind of like communicating um, possibilities. The question I often have, and I think that one of the things that for me as a fine artist was um, thinking about my work, which was predominantly going into installations and exhibitions in museums and galleries. And by moving over into um, animation and film, and also because we were very lucky and our film did pretty pretty well and um, was uh, you know went to the Oscars and then um, was screened on on TV, um, we reached really different audiences. And we I think probably one of my most amazing and kind of exciting comments was someone who emailed us to say I was going to see I don't know it was a Terminator or some other movie that was on there but it was filled up so I went to see the documentary animated shorts instead, and I couldn't believe I saw your film because my um, my brother um, uh, basically was murdered and I've always had a really uncomfortable relationship to um, the person who is still um, on death row. And your film brought this whole new perspective. And that felt like, wow. So the one place I think that's interesting and I always ask my art students is who's your audience? Who are you reaching? Um, and you know, questions often about, are you preaching to the converted? Who are you trying to reach? What's the purpose of the work you're trying to make? and thinking about that if there is an investment, because obviously you can make creative practice, which is transcendent and beautiful and relaxing and doesn't have to have these political components. Is that a good answer to that question? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, very good. Uh, so you might have addressed this, but uh, you might be able to go further. Uh, Stuart asked, did you speak with any of the family members or friends of the woman whom Manny killed Leah Shandell, right. did any of them not want the death penalty for Manny? Right, so um, I, we actually really pushed hard thinking about this question. This is a very complicated question. And one of the things we did not want to do was, was um, sort of like re-traumatize the, the, the family of the victim. Um, we uh, consulted with CRI who are trauma specialists and they recommended that we did not contact the family. They said the, the family themselves did not want to have any impact. The film was you know, internationally kind of like screened and we never heard anything from, from the family themselves. One of the other things about it was that Bill, Bill's family, Bill Babbitt's family who still doesn't really talk to him, um, did not talk to him uh, around this, even though the film went to the Oscars. Um, and in fact, Bill decided himself that he did not want to go with us to the Oscars because he felt that that would not be comfortable. And in fact, he said, it's my story and your film. But when we were given a um, Congressional Black Veterans Award for the film, um, he did come with us to um, Washington DC and accepted that award. And in fact, stood and spoke on behalf of Manny and his and and his his um, brother. So I think that was really meaningful. I don't know whether that answers any of the questions. It's definitely a question. And um, how does how does one? I'm sorry, there's a siren going up outside my house. <laughs> Not only do I have boxes because I'm moving, but I have a siren too. Um, but you know, it, it's really a critical question I have in terms of that. Clearly, this this is about um, people who have committed some crime or have been accused of a crime and we do not want to in any way um, you know, lessen that or, or make that um, something that's uh, going to harm the families of victims. Um, this is a, the story we're working on right now is very different because um, uh, um, Bill, um, Manny said that he committed the crime. He, he doesn't actually remember whether he did or not. Um, but you know, there was sort of like, it was an understanding that he had committed the crime. And the story we're dealing with now is a story of innocence, which is much more complicated and more, more ambiguous, um, potential in innocence. So, anyway, long answer. <laughs> Any other questions? So are we are we good there? Do we have anything else? Uh, so Chelsea asks, when is the next film expected to be released, and where would it, will it be available? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you. And I wish I knew that. <laughs> um, uh, we were held up a little by the pandemic because we actually are also trying to interview the um, 
the witnesses who recanted um, and that involved um, going to Savannah, Georgia. The whole thing is a story in Savannah, Georgia. And unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we were afraid we would um, not be well received, but also wanted to make sure that we um, didn't um, endanger anybody by interviewing them. So I'd say it's gonna be at least another year, maybe two years. And the other thing I would say for our process, um, which I talked about, I touched on a little bit, but um, we, are work, we have been working with um, UC Santa Cruz students um, on the project. So there's uh, several ways that we've been working with them. I've been paying students to work over summers with me, um, doing animations uh, like um, in our style. I've also been working with legal, legal study student uh, uh, who uh, just actually got a job now and is working professionally. And he was doing all of the um, uh, archival material and research around the legal case because it's a very complex legal case. Um, and uh, so we work with students um, and try to get them involved in the animation, talking about the, the issues, talking about the styles, talking about the writing, and then helping them move on into either professionally, if they're interested in being animators, if they're interested in the politics, um, connecting them to political organizations. So that's part of the kind of larger mission of the film, if that makes sense. So it doesn't answer exactly when, because I'm like, I don't know, I hope it will be soon. Once we've moved house, and finally, we're getting to a place where we can actually travel again and do the last of the interviews. We've, we've finished the interviews with the family and in fact, Martina is no longer alive, um, but, uh, but we are still working and, and principally we're working now on the animation and the last couple of interviews. Yeah, two years, maybe one year, we're lucky. We have to kind of really push on the film. Um, next. We have a quick question from Karina, just uh, you could go back to the slide about that community program at the end. Mm. Uh, that you're discussing. Sure. Um, if we could get some contact information there, maybe Diana, if you're listening, if you can put that link in the chat box. Okay, so oh, let me find it, sorry. Um, CRI, right, Community Resource Init Initiative. And I can, um, did we get uh, the link? Cause I can also put the link in too if you want. Um, if you have it handy. Yeah. Oh, um, Diana's got it up, thank you. This is actually uh, Diego who was, um, there's two, uh, the funding that they're looking for right now is actually to fund a program for people who were formerly incarcerated and who are now um, working for the organization and uh, doing um, community outreach and educational outreach with kids and young people to try to get people out of the cycle of violence that gets them into these really complicated situations. So this young man that you see in the image here is actually one of the people who they're, who they're they're funding to work with them in this capacity currently. Mm. Pretty exciting yeah. work, yeah. Do you already, do you have a relationship with them? Or are you working together? Yes, I do. Uh, so Community Re Resource Initiative um, actually came to the Oscars. Scarlett Nirad, who's the director, came to the Oscars with us <laughs> because, uh, because they, she was my plus one. Um, but they, um, they uh, were the people who recommended Bill to us and who have been working with us on Run With It traveling to make sure we don't re-traumatize anybody who's involved in the interviews that we're, we're doing. And also advising us on um, anything that would be triggers that people say perhaps that we shouldn't but put it in the film um, and recommending and helping us with the legal uh, elements of the, of the um, case because it's a fairly complicated case. So they're um, pretty integral to what we, what we do. And in fact, I think we're on their website. You can see just a picture of Bill in the bottom left-hand corner. I know they're going to do a little outreach this weekend because it's uh, this next week because it's Veterans Day. Mm. Um, uh, and looking at that, you can actually hear a video, you can see a video from this young guy, Diego, who's there too. Right. Mm, thank you. You're welcome. So uh, you have a few more slides, D, is that correct? I do, I have some more images if you'd like me to go back. I just was not quite sure exactly, considering your audience, who they would like with, um, uh, who they would like to, uh, the kind of um, emphasis. And so whether our emphasis was um, politics or whether our emphasis was um, animation, um, so what, this is one of the quotes I often bring to my students because I love it. So anybody out there who's a practitioner, um, this is actually um, Nabil um, Hamdi, who is an architect and, and he basically is an architect for refugees. Oops, 
I don't know where it went. Okay, and um, a quote was to say, practice disturbs. It can and does promote one set of truths, beliefs, systems, values, norms, powers, and gender relations in place of others. It can promote habits, routines, and technologies that may lead to new and unfamiliar ways of thinking, doing, organizing locally, nationally, and even globally. And the reason I put this, this quote in here was because basically the way we work is we draw images and then we discuss and debate um, the, the deeper kind of symbols and ethics and uh, concepts behind what we're doing. And then we experiment through drawing, through discussions, through interviews, and then through um, film and filming components, filming elements, and just practicing and experimenting until we come up with the work that we do. So a lot of this work is sort of intuitive and sort of intellectually um, researched based, but also intuitive in terms of the creative practice. And I just wanted to put that in there. I, I don't really quite know who your audience is, but it's an encouragement to everybody to think about the idea that practice itself, literally just doing and the making is actually what can bring us to new ways. And that um, uh, Nabil Hamdi is such an incredible example of that because literally he makes architecture with refugees. Um, I also thought that this was an interesting notion of the idea of community and kind of place. So this is a rock. It's actually a rock in Germany. And, um, and one of the things that um, uh, this was used for was by the small community to talk about. It was really seen by this little community as being their town. But what they realized, what this actual rock has moved all the way from north in Iceland, all the way down to Germany over the ages, and so thinking about the idea that actually this icon of what we think of as place and space and our community and us and not them actually um, could be very interesting in terms of that space and place moves. And so this is actually a quote um, thinking about, and this is uh, again from um, Eve Sedgwick, who I love her work, instead of thinking, and sorry, it's a, this is Doreen Massey, instead of thinking of places as areas with boundaries around, they can be imagined as our, our articulated moments in networks of social relations, and this in turn allows a sense of place, which includes a consciousness of its links with the wider world. And I think that's partly the motivation that we have for the work we're doing is to create a sense of intimacy and relationship through the animation, through that sense of connection with community that will allow people to see that their world is not just this little rock that's theirs and is on their neighborhood beach, but actually that rock is much larger and broader in the thinking. So many of my um, thoughts were like, how do we take that? This is another example where literally a, in 1995, these artists decided to reclaim the streets in Camden town, they set these, these things and they just decided to come as a street party and thinking about the idea that literally art as a practice could move into places that all of a sudden is, this is play or experiment or practice that allowed a whole different way. And literally they created these barriers so that the, the police could not clear them away because they were in these giant dinghies. And so, and this started to be a whole different way of kind of like protest. And so thinking about how can art, another example for Stuart, I think he was asking earlier, how can art create these places where there's a questioning? So maybe a challenge, maybe something. So they, they this, this um, these artist group decided to rename a section of a very classical old um, Spanish town, Nike Platz. <laughs> and proposed drawings of it. And so of course had massive protests from Vienna. Um, and then of course, this is another example of, uh, of um, everybody knows the yes men, right? The yes men is uh, basically managed to get the, themselves onto world news saying that Dow Chemicals was ex ex accepting full responsibility for a spill that they caused. And they managed to disguise themselves and actually get onto BBC TV world news. So how can you, as a practice, this is um, the Asta Gates work, how can you as a, a practitioner think about the creative work? Here's what he says, the reality in the neighborhood that I live in is if I don't constantly reconcile what I have against what other people don't, either I need to leave and be around other people who have what I have, or I'm constantly engaged in this kind of dynamic flow of opportunity and sharing. So what he's done is he bought all the houses that were next to his house that were actually going up for sale as, as an artist. 
collected all of the records and the, and the um, books from the area of the bookstore that was going out of uh, practice, out of business, and has created a whole community of places for artists and other community members to work together. And so just thinking about, you asked me for some inspiration, so I'm, I'm scouring through my, my slides for these inspirations of other artists. So um, example of an art, regimes of human rights connect through witnessing, resistance, cultural survival, education, reconciliation, and restorative justice. Ugh, now it doesn't really let me move through here. So, um, um, and then just thinking about notions of this is also another example of, a, of Claudia Rankin as a poet and the, the notions of visibility and invisibility. So this is a quote from a poem from her in the line at the drugstore, it's finally your turn. And when it's not, as he walks in front of you, puts his things on the counter, the cashier says, sure, she was next. And he turns to you, he's truly surprised. Oh my God, I didn't see you. You must be in a hurry, you offer. No, no, I really didn't see you. And so just thinking about visibility and connection. And then this is a quote from another of her poems, because white men can't police their imagination, black men are dying. So thinking about many ways in which we can, and I'll stop sharing again. Um, did I stop my sharing? Yeah, sorry. After all these um, many months, you'd think that the, this, the, it would be possible to get Zoom much more smoothly, but unfortunately it isn't. So I hope that that gives you some kind of like motivations of how we're thinking about, I'm thinking about the practice and how we're thinking about the practice. And um, I don't know if there's any last questions anybody has for me. Yes, actually, we have a few. Janet asked, in considering your comment about animation and encouraging a wider audience, people who wouldn't normally choose to watch a documentary on a subject like what you have chosen is because animation is normally associated with stories that are more cheerful, mm -hmm. or even cartoons. Or do you have other considerations that are more important? And if so, what other ideas on this do you have? So I think you're right. I mean, part of the desire for animation was because it will bring access in ways and bring audiences in who would not ordinarily listen and pay attention. It also has a possibility of metaphor. So um, it's possible to tell a story and have the person telling their story and have images bring brought forward that can trigger or promote other forms of, of thinking. Obviously you can do that in a film, but it, it's in much more of a kind of direct way. You have to scan to something or move to something. You can also move time in time in different ways from one time period to another. But I think the principle was to think about what is another way to allow people to hear and see and tell a story? And that's the principal reason that we've looked at animation and think about animation. Um, and also, as I, as I said before, just thinking about how close can you get to somebody that ordinarily it's not comfortable to be here, but somehow because they're animated, you can bring them there. You can bring other elements in the background. You can pull them into different contexts. You can switch and kind of like juxtapose two periods of time, bring two people together. You can fade, you can remove someone. At some point, I have to say, it's always interesting to work. Uh, if we do, often we, we edit ourselves, but then we get uh, editors to come and work with us. And they're always like, yeah, yeah, you can't use that image, for example, as you see some of the work we were doing. They'll say, you can't use that because it doesn't have the right background. And we're like, I oh, know, it can have any background you like. It could have any foreground you like. It could be far away, it could be near. So the possibilities are pretty endless. And so they have a possibility to be push that possibility of how one sees and hears a story. And I think that's what convinces for me, the use of animation. Thank you. Uh, we, we have a question from Stephanie. This is, is kind of a long question, so maybe I'll, I'll read it. And then we, I can go back if we need to break sure. the pieces, right? Uh, I wonder if uh, if D could talk more about what seems to be a recent surge in graphic forms to talk mm. about histories of oppression and silence. Mm. Comic journalism, graphic memoirs, and animation seem to be of great interest to readers at the moment. What's going on with readers, information flows, and the way we consume the visual these days that might account for this interest? Uh, and the sub question: uh, Does D think of her own work? A response to animation history in any way? 
That was a great question. So yeah, in fact, um, I, I would say I'm actually teaching a class and, and it's going to be an opportunity for undergrad students uh, um, by um, uh, two alumni actually who have uh, funded uh, they, I'm a director of the Arts Research Institute. This is a long answer, but it will get there. Um, and uh, uh, and basically, we're doing a comics competition, and we're we're taking it connected to um, some of the archives that are in the uh, in the in the uh, UC Santa Cruz libraries in, in in the McHenry Library, and thinking about why is animation right now. Um, I think comics and the subversive and the underground has always been present and there. I mean really, really rife a long history of, um, of uh, propaganda and comics and cartoons and, and, and promotion and advertising. Anytime it seems to me where there's massive ruptures in culture, these kind of like alternative methods of communication come kind of bubbling up. Um, there's always that sense of othering that happens within, within um, kind of like mainstream cartoons and graphics, which I think is really sort of important. Um, if anybody is interested in this comics competition, let me know. Happy to talk to you about it. Um, but um, how, so that was one part of the question. Why are that's happening right now? I think that the visual and our relationship to the visual has shifted as I, as I sort of spoke very briefly about. Um, how we digest visual information is becoming more and more and more complex and faster and faster and faster. And there's something about the still image, kind of like one image, Kind of connected to another that I think and that space between two images that is significant and is more and more significant the more we are sort of visually promote a kind of like um, uh, driven culture. Um, it slows down and speeds up all at once. I think we're impatient. I also see younger people being more impatient in terms of wanting to get to the story. I don't know any of you have kids and if you show your kids all those movies you thought were really fantastic and they're like, uh, I'm bored, where's the, where's, the, where's the hit of the movie? How is it kind of sped up? So something about these um, other visual kind of like communication methods. I love graphics novels and I'm, I'm really invested in, in that. I think that any culture, counterculture moments, um, Risograph, for example, of the, the new method of printing, which is just coming up as echo method of printing is really bringing that resurgence forward. Um, and I don't know, maybe there's always moments that we don't know about them as much from other cultural moments. Um, do I think about the history of animation? Yes, very much so. Um, some of what I'm, I'm referring to is frequently all over the place from, you know, what is happening in the Czech Republic and the history of animated kind of imagery. And on the other hand, you know, what's happening in the newest Apple imagery. On the on the on the posters and the and in um, ads because what I want to make sure what I'm doing is bringing what I'm to what I'm depicting to an audience that will be able to legibly read and understand what I'm thinking about in multiple layers, and that's really critical and that's what's so fantastic about teaching at the same time and having students work on these animated images too, is because that really helps um, keep me current. Uh, in what's happening and also learning from the students at the same time. Hopefully that was some sort of answer to that question. It's a great question. I, I, it's probably a good way to begin my, my talk if I could uh, go back and do that. <laughs> Any last questions we have? I see we have just five minutes. Uh, um, uh... We have a, just a factual question. Uh, when, <laughs> when was the white policeman murdered uh, in your upcoming film, uh, 1989? Um... 89 yeah okay. so basically it was a it was a big uh, big case it didn't become a big case until amnesty um kind of got hold of it which was in the in the um late 90s early 2000s but yeah 89 was when the white police officer was killed um and and in in you know and i'm un unclear exactly what happened still to this day you know yeah, thank you and a question question from karina do you think it's important to tell both sides of the story to include both the offender and the victim? Oftentimes victims families are the ones forgotten. Yeah. Absolutely, I think that that's a really critical. I think for our films, we really struggled with that for a long time. Personally, I didn't want to make a PBS documentary that was you this side and then this side and this side and then this side. I wanted to focus and say, this is about the impact of capital punishment on, on communities and families 
that are impacted by capital punishment by having somebody who was executed or was on death row. And so it's not supposedly or any way to limit or dismiss the victim's families in the least, but just to say, let's look at this tiny slice. I think the next part, I will look at another tiny slice, but I really like the possibility of letting one person sit and tell you something for 30 minutes rather than um, trying to be a journalist and, and give you all sides to a story. Um, so it's just, I, I think that's uh, a choice. It's challenging choice because somebody died and there is a victim. Um, I think there's a lot of places where that story is told it doesn't mean it's any less important. And there are very, very few places where the impacts on, on, on a larger community story is told. And so I wanted to focus on that. Okay, and we have, we have one more question, um, but we're almost out of time. I'll just mm -hmm. ask you to give a, a brief answer. Sure. But Stuart asks, uh, uh, I'm wondering if there was an application of animation to such topics of controversy in the pre-photographic era, such as flipbooks. Yeah, it's a really great question. And I don't know what the answer is to that, but I have to go and look it up now. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, it was a privilege to talk to you. I'm sorry I had a couple of glitches there. I have to say that uh, I, the, my, I, for some reason, one of my clips got shown twice. So my apologies for that. But <laughs> anybody who's interested in seeing others, please email me. I'm happy to talk about anything in the future. Oh, thank you so much, Dee. Um, and I think uh, maybe we can we can edit that out in, in post, maybe. Okay, right? great. <laughs> and uh, um, so just a big round of our virtual applause. You can type uh, type uh, comments or you know uh, in, in the chat box there. But a big round of applause uh, for Dee. Thank you again. Um, so thank you for sharing your work and your process with us this, this, this evening, especially the the clip of your upcoming work. That's a real treat to see that before anybody else. Uh, and you've given us the link to the full length uh, version of your film. So and we can all go off and watch that. Um, this, uh, for the audience, this talk has been recorded. It will be available on the UC Santa Cruz Arts and Lectures YouTube channel in a few days. We'll follow up on our social media. Thank you emails uh, with that link uh, as soon as it's available. So um, also I'd like to thank our, our wonderful staff in the alumni office and the university special events offices who set up this online forum. So thank you, Shana, Diana, Paulina, and Kristen. Our next thank event- Thank you to them too. Mm -hmm. uh, indeed. Uh, our next event, Monday, December 13th, will feature Professor Mark Amengual, Associate Professor of Applied Linguistics and the Director of UCSC's Bilingualism Research Laboratory. His talk is titled, Monolingualism Can Be Cured and What This Means for Bilingual Speech. He will dispel several myths about bilingualism, offer an overview of cognitive benefits of being bilingual and conclude with evidence of the resourcefulness of multilinguals in overcoming cross-language influences. Mark's research focuses on experimental phonetics, bilingualism, and psycholinguistics. And I can't wait to find out what that is. <laughs> Sounds fantastic. I can't wait to hear <laughs> We can count on an audience. Thank you. I don't um, see the debrief chat, just, to, just so that I don't see that anyway, if anybody could send that to me. Oh, certainly. Thank you um, so much. So meanwhile, uh, there are many other upcoming UCSC events on the calendar. Tomorrow, UCSC will honor alumna Dr. Barbara Ferrer as this year's Alumni Achievement Award recipient. She graduated from Rachel Carson College in 1978 with a degree in community studies. She now leads the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. As a backdrop, UCSC is preparing to launch a new global and community health program and Grant Herzog, Professor of Molecular Cell and Developmental Biology, and Matt Spark, Professor of Politics, will join the conversation to discuss Dr. Ferrer's path from UC Santa Cruz the, to the Department of Public Health. The lessons learned over the last two years, leading one of the largest counties in the country through a global pandemic, and the important role of global and community health. On November 17th, the Crawl Lecture Series will update us on future studies of exoplanets. Andy Skimmer, Pro Associate Professor of Astronomy and Astrophysics, We'll explain how new instrumentation at University of California's Keck Observatory and the impending launch of NASA's James Webb, Sp James Webb Space Telescope will allow studies of the composition, physical structures, and weather of planets orbiting other stars. Information of these and many more events are found at events.ucsc.edu. On behalf of the UC Santa Cruz Alumni Association, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you, Dee, Professor Herbert-Jones. 
And please come back on December 13th, 6.30 p.m. for our next virtual event. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>